Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Heather Marsh from the Chartered Banker Institute, and I'm delighted to welcome you all to our webcast, Rethinking Risk After the Pandemic. At the end of 2019, the Risk Coalition published its principles-based guidance for risk committees and risk functions in financial services. Raising the Bar was published in December 2019 with the support of the regulators. At this discussion event, we'll introduce you to the Risk Coalition's work and our panel ex experts will discuss whether the Risk Coalition's guidance might have better prepared financial services firms for the consequences of the pandemic and consider how firms' approach to risk oversight and risk management will need to change in future. If you have any questions during the presentation, there will be a chance to ask these after the panel discussion. I hope you enjoyed today's discussion. And I'll now hand you over to Hanif Barma, co-founder at the Risk Coalition and partner at, Bo at Board Alchemy. Thank you, Heather, um, and thank, thank you to the Chartered Bankers Institute, uh, particularly for hosting this event for us. I think we're uh, going to be having a very good conversation today. Looking forward to uh, chatting with Liz, Cosette and Robert. Um, let me share my screen um, and um, start off with a bit of introduction. So, uh, Okay, so um, just before starting, uh, I'd just like to mention that uh, if everyone can stay on mute for the time being, and uh, we'll take questions a little bit later on uh, once uh, we've heard from all the panelists. Um, I'll also just mention that the session is being recorded and it will be available in the next few days uh, from the Charter Bankers Institute's website. Um, and uh, what, what I'd like to do is just spend a few minutes running through a little bit of background about the Risk Coalition and our work and then um, hand, hand over to our panel to say a few words before we move into Q&A. So maybe it's just starting off, uh, really just uh, say a few things about myself. I'm a co-founder of the Risk Coalition along with a number of colleagues. Uh, my main role with the Risk Coalition was really developing the coalition concept and leading industry and regulatory stakeholder engagement. Um, in my day job, um, I'm a consultant, a governance consultant uh, at my firm Board Alchemy and really focus on uh, board, uh, board effectiveness reviews and looking at risk and audit uh, effectiveness as well. Um, I also sit on a number of boards and committees, uh, mainly audit and risk committees, um, and really uh, hope to bring that experience to today's discussion. Um, our first um, guest uh, panelist is Liz Sandwith. Liz is Chief Professional Practices Advisor at the Chartered Institute of Internal Auditors. She's got a very strong internal audit background with 30 years experience in internal audit, covering a range of sectors, including financial services. I'm particularly pleased that Liz has been able to join us today as she's been uh, one of our working group for the uh, Risk Coalition as we've been developing Raising the Bar over the last couple of years. Um, also like to welcome Robert, uh, Robert Beatty, Senior Risk and Audit Executive, who's got an extensive experience of risk and audit through uh, banking, insurance and also the energy sector. Robert's now Chief Operating Officer for the Risk Function at Virgin Money, and his main priority at the moment is recasting the role of Virgin Money's Risk Function. And he's basing a lot of the remodeling of the, the function based on the guidance from the Risk Coalition. So I uh, very much look forward to hearing from you, Robert, about how, uh, how you see that guidance as helping you achieve that, and particularly um, in the light of the pandemic, whether that's gonna make any changes. And Cosette is our third panelist, uh, bringing a first line point of view, but Cosette has very wide experience covering the three lines. Uh, she's a founder of Permuto Consulting, very experienced in risk management, having uh, worked in financial services for 25 years. She also uh, has a number of non-executive roles, which uh, focus on the risk space as well. And she's also a, a certified company secretary. Cosette's also an examiner for the Financial Times non-executive program uh, so I, I think we'll get some really good insights from our panel today. So really looking forward to what they have to say. Um, I'll just start off with uh, just a few words about the Risk Coalition uh, for those of you who are less familiar with it. So um, really the, net, the Risk Coalition is a network of not-for-profit professional bodies and membership organisations who are all committed to raising the standards of risk oversight and risk governance in, in the UK. We set up the Risk Coalition in 2018 
and uh, our risk guidance initiative was set up to introduce and develop principles-based guidance of high quality uh, for risk committees and risk functions in the financial services sector. The, the work took about two years to do and we finally launched it in December last year at the Financial, uh, reporting, Council, uh, Financial reporting Council's offices in London. I mentioned the Risk Coalition was a coalition is an association of uh, membership bodies and professional bodies. These are our key members. Uh, you can see the Chartered Bankers Institute is there, uh, along with the other chartered financial bodies, Chartered Insurance Institute and Chartered Institute of Securities and Investment. Uh, obviously delighted that the Chartered Institute of Internal Auditors, who Liz is representing, is, is there as well, along with the various risk professional bodies, the Institute of Faculty, uh, of actuaries and other bodies who all have this common interest in raising the standards of risk oversight. Looking at why we developed the guidance, um, I think really just reflecting on why we did it, there are a number of reasons. One is a pretty broad objective of raising uh, expectations and promoting good practice within UK financial services. Secondly, it was about developing a common understanding of the purpose and remit of board risk committees and risk functions. And this was an area I found quite interesting. Um, very early on in the process, I interviewed a risk committee chair who said, actually, something like this would have been really useful to him when he first took over the role, because there was nothing actually around that set out what a risk committee should do. So he had to kind of piece together himself what that would be. Another important reason is to provide a benchmark to help risk committees and risk functions objectively assess themselves. And uh, again, a, a senior risk professional at one of the big banks said to me, basically, this would be really useful for him because his risk committee keeps asking him how, how his team are doing. Um, and basically, he's got no yardstick against which to benchmark them. So he felt that this was something that would really help him as well. And frankly, at the end of the day, uh, I think there was a sense that there was a gap that needed filling. Uh, there's no principles-based guidance for risk functions and risk committees, uh, unlike the Corporate Governance Code, which talks about boards, audit committees, uh, remuneration, nominations committee. It just mentions risk committees in passing, um, but not really focuses on it. And uh, the Chartered Institute of Internal Auditors, I'm sure Liz will tell us a little bit more later, have produced some excellent guidance for internal audit in financial services. And that was, in a sense, uh, a bit of a role model for us to try and achieve in the risk space as well. Uh, a few points on scope. So first of all, we're really focused on UK financial services. Uh, we wanted to have a fairly discrete um, area to focus on. And the first project of ours uh, is the guidance for uh, financial services firms. Um, we will look at other sectors as subsequent projects. It's important to know that the guidance is principles based. So we're really focused on improving outcomes. It's meant to be a proportionally applied. So we have uh, a number of principles, eight for risk committees and nine for risk functions. And below that, uh, a number of paragraphs of guidance. But really the objective is to try and make sure that you're achieving the right outcomes and achieving the principles. And I think those principles can be applied to organizations of all sizes. And finally, we haven't tried to be prescriptive. And what we haven't tried to set out to do is explain how different risks should be managed. What we've done is provide a framework um, within which uh, a risk committee and risk function can operate and deal with the whole gamut of risks that they actually face. Um, just a, a couple of, uh, a number of quotes I thought would be helpful just to give you some idea of the feedback that we've had. Uh, the first one top left is from uh, Michael Minnelli, who was actually writing our forward for us for uh, raising the bar. And he expressed surprise as, as to the fact that there was no uh, principles-based guidance around already. Uh, you can read M Michael's full introduction, his views in, in the forward to the document. Uh, top right is a comment from the Investment Association, uh, membership body for asset managers, and they've said basically that they see this as helping strengthen strengthening the companies in which they invest, so they see the guidance as a good thing. And the two quotes at the bottom, um, I'll let you two have a quick read yourself, but they're basically from uh, a CRO and a Chief Internal Auditor, uh, again, expressing support for what we've done. Um, and I suppose really, in a way, one of the key aspects people ask us is what do the regulators think? And um, we've got a quote from the Financial Conduct Authority, uh, and they've basically said three things. One is they very much welcome the initiative to introduce the risk guidance. Secondly, that it is compatible with their approach uh, to focus on personal accountability. And I think very helpfully, they say not to use the guidance as a tick box exercise, but to really to make sure that good outcomes are being achieved. 
We also had a call from the Financial Reporting Council. And what they say, I think, which is of importance, is that the guidance is consistent with the aims of the Corporate Governance Code. So I think it sits very nicely, uh, nestles in with it very nicely uh, as, a, as a basis. So raising the bar itself, uh, there's a front image of the a document at the top uh, of the of the uh, of the screen at the moment. We've set it out in two parts: Part A, which is focusing on risk committees, and Part B, looking at risk functions. Um, there's a link there that you can see, uh, which will show you where the guidance is. But if you look at riskcoalition.org.uk, you'll be able to download a copy for free um, at your leisure. And I hope you find that of interest if you haven't had a chance to read it already. Um, the, the plan for the, this session is um, I'll turn to our expert panel in a, in a moment to get some views from them and then go through Q&A. That will take us up to two o'clock. After, after that, uh, we've developed a self-assessment tool uh, called GABI, Gap Analysis and Benchmarking Insights tool uh, at the Risk Coalition. And that's now available for both parts A for risk committees, part B for risk functions. And I'll give you a short demonstration of that for about 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, and I'd be happy to take questions as part of that as well, if you're able to stay on until 2.30. So um, that's really the, the key bits I wanted to cover. Let me get rid of that and go back to our panel. And um, perhaps uh, I could start with Robert, since Robert, you're in the second line and uh, you're trying to recast the role of your risk function. Be very interested to get your views about how the guidance has helped you, but also kind of how things are changing in this world that we find ourselves in uh, currently in the pandemic and how things might change afterwards. Uh, Robert, can I hand over to you? Absolutely. Thanks, Hanif. Um, can you hear me OK, Hanif? Just checking. Yes. Great. Um, so I'm not sure on the screen. Um, it seems to be showing end of slideshow. Click to exit. Hanif, I'm not sure if there's something you need to do um, there. Um, that's better. Thank you. Um, so, look, uh, hello, everybody. Um, I'm, I'm pleased to, to be here today and, and um, thank you for joining the call. Uh, I, I probably um, Part of the introduction, just to mention that, that I am currently the Risk uh, Chief Operating Officer for Virgin Money. For those who don't know, Virgin Money was kind of formed um, in its current format um, following the acquisition of what was Virgin Money by Clydesdale and Yorkshire Bank Group. Um, so we've been in operation now since about October 18, and we've been operating as one bank um, following kind of FISMA Part 7 activity from the end of last year. We're the sixth largest bank in the UK um, and we're a full service bank. Uh, we're probably going through a lot of the challenges that banks face at the moment in terms of customer behaviour and how it's changing. Uh, you know, customers looking to interact very differently and in large part digitally uh, going forward. But we still have obviously other services um, and ways of serving customers that we need to maintain. For those who, who don't know, I've been uh, an internal auditor really for the, the majority of the last part of my career. I've been eight years as the serving um, group director of internal for Virgin Money and Clydesdale Bank before that. And I just want to mention, and building on what Hanif said, that I found the code that was brought in by the Institute of Internal Auditors in 2013 post-crisis to be incredibly helpful um, in raising the bar for internal audit functions. And when Hanif mentioned that this um, guidance was being developed for risk functions, I was a big supporter because I think it's incredibly important that um, risk functions and board risk committees have something to reference when they're looking at how they're performing and how they're shaping up. Um, so it's been really helpful to be involved in the development of the guidance. Um, and as we think about the challenges we currently face, um, they, they are uh, numerous and um, pretty complex. Um, and for those on the call who've also been going through the, the, the kind of challenges for their customers and their businesses um, raised by COVID in particular, we, we've got kind of new language developing in our business, which is all about uh, COVID pace uh, and operating at COVID pace and what that means. We've got the whole language of uh, working from home, which many of us did in the past, um, but not to this extent and certainly not to the extent that we've we needed to kind of morph into over a very, very short uh, period of time. So having a good risk management framework in place while you make these kinds of changes are, are incredibly important. 
Um, the other part of this is that we're really considering um, how we move from an incident um, that's been running for a number of uh, months, uh, you know, a typical incident management activity. How do we move um, into much more of a BAU kind of operating model? And what does that mean for our future operating model? So, so again, having good governance, uh, having good decision making and good consideration of the risks through all of these changes that we're in the course of making is going to be really, really important. And what we don't really understand yet, Hanif, is what, what's a kind of permanent shift in behaviour, both for customers um, and colleagues and an operating model versus what's a kind of temporary fix. Uh, and we need to have good controls and governance in place over both. Um, the other aspect that you may have noticed in the press that Virgin Money has been following closely is um, contagion risks. Uh, and those that have um, given rise to, you know, lots of press coverage of the Virgin brand more generally, um, which is heavily impacted by the uh, COVID uh, experience. And we need to work out um, how we work with the Virgin group to make sure that we're managing those risks effectively as well. So, Luke, it's been a very, very <laughs> interesting experience to go through um, the, the the governance um or sorry, the guidance that came out for internal auditors was developed, you know, three or four years after the last kind of major uh, challenge that the UK faced, um, in particular in financial services. And we're now seeing another one play out. Uh, and I'm going to be interested in hearing from those joining the call today what your kind of thoughts are on your own businesses and how they're performing and questions that you might have for us um, as a panel uh, about how this particular guidance and the tools that are coming out, um, the Gabby tool, for example, might help support how we understand what our different businesses are thinking about um, going forward. So thank you. With that, Hanif, I'll hand back to you. Thank, thank you, Robert. Um, I'll pick, come, come to you in a second, Liz, but can I just ask Robert one quick question? Uh, I was very interested to hear you talk about the permanent changes versus temporary changes, Robert, in terms of uh, customer behaviour. Um, I was, I was just wondering, what, what is your filter to work out whether something's temporary or permanent? Do you, do you kind of reach out to expertise in, in behaviour or how, how, how do you kind of work out what's here to stay? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think increasingly all of our businesses are being data driven. Yeah. So we're monitoring real time the data about our customers' behaviour and what they're doing. Uh, you know, are they going into stores? Um, branches, if you like, um, what transactions are they performing in those branches? How is their use of digital um, in terms of a channel and, and a way of serving customers changing? Uh, and we're seeing that real time every single day. And we're seeing things go up and then kind of tail off or plateau. We're seeing other things continue sure. to rise. We're seeing customers, in, in fact, uh, interestingly, you know, some of the most vulnerable customers to COVID having stayed away from branches, but now with things changing more recently in terms of relaxation of rules, we're seeing those customers return. And it, in some ways it's surprising um, because they're coming in to do fairly basic things, but there is clearly a social aspect to the interaction that customers have with banks and other organisations, which is important. Okay. Thank you, Robert. Um, we can maybe pick up on some of that in the discussion and maybe hear what others have to say. Liz, welcome and uh, be, be great to hear what you have to say. Uh, thank you very much, Hanif. Thank you, Heather, for inviting me to today's um, session. Um, it's becoming almost a way of life, isn't it? Um, communicating and talking via uh, a virtual forum. Um, but for those of you that don't know, the Chartered Institute of Internal Auditors UK and Ireland is the only professional body dedicated exclusively to training, supporting and representing internal auditors across all sectors in the UK and Ireland. And we have approximately 10,000 members. And our members are part as also of a global network of over 200,000 members with a presence in 170 countries. And we all work to the same international standards and codes of ethics. During COVID-19, um, the pandemic, we've been running as an institute a virtual Heads of Internal Audit forum every Wednesday, open to members and non-members to explore the challenges that internal audit profession has faced. So, for example, some internal audit members have been redeployed. Um, and that might mean that they have been working in first line 
and or second line. And I'm very aware of a, a head of internal audit in the NHS who has been driving around nurses to care homes to undertake COVID testing. Um, and also some have been furloughed. And I'm aware of a large retail organization where all of the internal audit function has been furloughed during the last um, 16 of the 18 weeks. Um, we took a very much conscious decision um, to open our forum and we've also created a, a COVID-19 hub where we have technical guidance, blogs um, from not just the UK, but colleagues in France, Australia and the US to members and non-members, because we felt that this wasn't the moment to be very focused on only addressing or supporting members. So we've been very conscious about um, recognising that the internal audit profession uh, needed some support through something that probably none of us have ever seen the scale of this before. And even if we survived through the uh, financial crisis, um, that wasn't quite the same global and impactful scenario that we have had um, across every sector um, from the COVID-19. One of the things that we have also been involved in or the profession has been involved in is providing real-time assurance. And that's been working in the first line, new processes, um, new um, requirements brought in, perhaps government funding, making your furloughed application for funding, um, also swapping what you do. So if you take companies like Burberry and Barber, they've moved from making designer products, wax jackets, into creating PPE. So the heads of internal audit have been looking at the processes. Have we got the right controls in place? And was the were the decisions made um, based on customer need and the requirements in our particular scenario? So we've also uh, been working as heads of internal audit with our risk colleagues and the Institute has been very strong in its weekly meetings to say to our members and non-members, those attending, you need to be talking more to your key stakeholders. So those are our risk colleagues as well as our audit committee chairs and members and working with our risk colleagues to identify new and emerging risks. So things like, you know, loss of revenue, uh, cost saving requirements, um, new processes, changing products, goods or services, etc. And particularly around supply chain. And as we move forward as a profession, we're looking to reimagine what the profession might look like. For example, one of the things that we're talking a lot about at the moment is stronger relationships. So building on what we've learned through COVID to help us uh, continue to build that relationship with our risk management colleagues and equally important, our audit committees and in the financial services sector, very much our risk committees. So making sure that that relationship, the linkage between the two is strong so that we benefit um, or the organisations benefit for, from all of this. IIA Global, you remember I mentioned them at the beginning, has only this week um, launched a revised three lines of defence model and they've called it three lines. They've dropped the use of the word defence. As we might expect, the first roles are very much directly aligned with the delivery of products and services to clients and organisations and includes the roles of support functions. Second line roles provide assistance with managing risk as they do currently. But interestingly, the new model reflects that first and second line roles may be blended as well as separated. So there's a slightly different nuance here as we move forward. And they talk about second line roles focusing on specific objectives of risk management, such as compliance with laws, regulations and acceptable ethical behaviour internal control, information and technology security, sustainability and quality assurance. So they are being a lot more specific about some of the roles of the second line, which I think is really helpful as we move forward.
They're also recognising that second line may have um, their role may span a broader responsibility for risk management, such as the enterprise risk management. But they are very clear that responsibility for managing risk remains part of the first line roles and within the scope of management. The Institute's guidance on effective internal audit in the financial services, also known as the Financial Services Code, some of you will be familiar with it, I'm sure. We are planning on refreshing it and republishing it later this year after we did a survey um, in the very early part of this year. So it is continually being updated. And I was really pleased to hear um, that, you know, Hanif and I have worked together um, on the uh, risk coalition guidance using a similar model and approach to the financial code that we have used. And I hope that moving forward, Hanif will also do as the Institute has done and move from a simple code for the financial services sector into a code for the private sector and third sectors, which is what we have recently done and published at the beginning of this year, because then together we are keeping our risk and our internal audit colleagues aligned, which I think is particularly important, particularly in, in view of the new world that we are all facing and the uncertainties, the vast number of uncertainties. The Institute has supported the Risk Coalition throughout the creation of its risk um, guidance and was really pleased to see the re recent introduction of GABI, um, which I believe you're going to see um, a demonstration of later, which is its online gap analysis and benchmarking insight service, which is really important. And one of the things that the Institute is looking at how we can do better in terms of benchmarking. Personally, I'm delighted that colleagues in risk and internal audit continue to support each other and perhaps, and I hope, that the pandemic has strengthened that relationship further and that relationship continues as we move forward. The Institute is advocating that our members work with their risk colleague, and I think this is particularly important, to reset the risk agenda for the remainder of this year and moving forward. because. Everything I'm hearing says that COVID-19 is the thing that's on everyone's agenda now. But as we move forward through the next two, three, four years, we're going to be faced with recession, climate change and heaven knows what else. So internal audit and risk working together is my nirvana. Thank you, Hanif. Thank you, Liz. Um, let's move on to Cosette and uh, get her perspective of uh, where risk is at the moment and how it needs to change. Cosette. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for having me here today. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. I wanted to begin by sharing my thoughts about how we entered this year and then how COVID-19 has changed the game, building on what my other colleagues have already said. So coming into this year in financial services, um, evolution of the conduct and more generally the culture agenda within financial services institution continued to be one of several key areas of focus for our regulators. And one of the things that's very exciting about the raising the bar guidance that was published at the end of last year is that it plays a role in being able to make transparent and to articulate more explicitly some of the activities in that space that financial services institutions are undertaking. But now let's reflect upon what's happened since the start of the year. We've had a situation where, as we've noted from what our colleagues have just said a few moments ago, that people have been working from home, that we've had to scramble to refashion products and services, sometimes fundamentally, if you consider what's happened outside of financial services, for example, taking the Burberry example, um, where manufacturing of completely different things was suddenly undertaken for the greater good of all. Coming back to financial services, that manifested more fundamentally at the start in a couple of key things with the immediate exploration of the capital foundations of financial services institutions, and in some cases, the, the uh, request, shall we say, 
that banks cancel giving out dividends and take other actions to ensure that they safeguarded capital, since particularly in the early days, there was really no way to know how the situation was going to unfold. In addition to that, banks were also keen to be seen to contributing to helping communities in other ways. And many financial institutions have implemented charitable donations, both of staff time and outright investment monies, to give back to people who need it the most. Thinking about um, the remarks that were made about the changes in delivery of products and services, one of the observations about this is if we think about um, trading floor markets kinds of activities, we saw particularly in the early days of the pandemic really taking hold that there was a huge amount of volatility and of course more worryingly a decline in the outright value of assets, particularly in areas such as bond yields um, and oil and equities. And so in examining the unique situations that those market activities have created that in turn gave rise to thinking about debt and liquidity with our corporate and institutional clients and also then thinking about how changing products and services and how client interaction needed to change from because of people working from home and the other avenues of improving things to respond to the situation. One of the interesting things about working from home from a risk and control perspective is that things such as surveillance, recorded conversations, timely filing of transactions, best execution orders were all extremely challenging, particularly in situations where um, it was discovered that being able to record conversations or execute certain kinds of activities could not be done in the early days because the infrastructure investment just wasn't deep enough across all people to accommodate it. So from a risk management perspective in the first line, there were some very key challenges that needed to be worked through in order to be both compliant to regulation and as well as responsive to customer and market needs and conditions. This also manifested on the retail side most of which this was discussed previously in the comments from Robert, where we looked at individual customers and small and medium enterprises and considered again, not only the vulnerable customers and their unique needs during this time and how those were changing, but how the revision of products and services needed to then manifest itself in policy and in control and other things in a, in a time where being able to quickly revise and deploy these things in a controlled and considered manner was quite challenging. I think also another thing to think about is the prioritization of work. Projects that were key compliance or control projects um, at the beginning of the year were suddenly having to be put to one side to be responsiveness to be responsive to the situation that we found ourselves in. However, the needs to evolve our risk and control framework from a first and second line perspective, of course, have not gone away. So now as we um, are coming out of this uh, first phase of the COVID-19 situation, we are grappling in the first line with how we rebalance our prioritization of work. We also then need to think finally about governance and what this means for that. Thinking firstly about senior managers, thinking about the reallocation of prescribed responsibilities and leadership um, in a situation where some people were ill. We needed to think about the caretaking of staff, um, furloughed or otherwise, and making sure that they were looked after in the appropriate way. We needed to think about operational resilience and cyber risk for our customers, both corporate and individual. But more, more, moreover, at the top of the house, we also now we need to start thinking about how do we articulate our views on risk management now in light of where we are. And this is where the Risk Coalition's guidance and principles can really lend some additional support to thinking these things through. For example, at the board level, we can reflect upon principle A4, which talks about the principal roles and continued viability. And when you think about continued viability in the context of financial services, you know, 
And that's a very interesting situation from a risk and control perspective. When I look outside financial services into the third sector, for example, there were already very swiftly put into place um, explicit requirements as annual reporting seasons were coming due throughout this period that charities be able to assert up to the minute information about continuing to be a going concern during the course of this crisis and in the immediate near future. And there are similar concerns um, about that in the financial services sector to ensure that there is that ongoing capital stability and operational resilience. From an executive level, we also should be thinking about the risk governance and the leadership uh, that is required in reestablishing the policies, procedures, and controls, the first and second line working together to refresh that and particularly to assess the temporary versus permanent shifts in, cost, in customer behavior and in products and services. Finally, I'm looking forward to seeing more about Gabi and hearing more about this from Hanif. And we talk about the Gabi service and the risk coalition in general in an upcoming article that we anticipate will be out with us in a few days that talks about the importance of this work. Back to you, Hanif. Great. Great, thank you thank very you much, Gazette. Um, I'd uh, be delighted to take uh, any questions from uh, any, any anybody participating. If you've got any questions or comments that you'd like to make, perhaps you can use the uh, the show hand, raise your hand for, uh, facility, and I can come to you. Uh, but in the meantime, maybe I can just uh, ask a question of our panel, uh, Robert, Liz, and Cosette. Um, and I guess one of the things I've been quite intrigued with is actually um, we've been talking about horizon scanning for a long time. Um, I just wondered, does has the pandemic actually meant um, there's a, that there needs to be a change in approach to how that is done, or do board members actually need to understand how their firms are undertaking horizon scanning uh, better? Uh, maybe Cosette um, can start off with you. Sure, I'm happy to do that. I think you know. What horizon scanning means, I think, has changed, and it's expanded to consider um, this new kind of situation that perhaps was not given uh, the weight it may have done previously. And it's not like we haven't been here before. We've seen SARS, we've seen other ac ap epidemics break out over the last 20 years in particular. And yet the horizon scanning about how situations like this could manifest and impact customers and products and services has not necessarily been given the, the weight or depth of thought and planning for that other risks may have done. So I do think that that will um, impact uh, how we horizon scan going forward. Okay, thank you. Uh, Liz, do you have a, anything to add to that? Uh, anything brief to add? Uh, I absolutely uh, agree with, with Cosette, and I think that we need to, as a, an internal audit profession, um, I said earlier, I think it's about working with our risk colleagues um, to understand from both perspectives, which really are the risks that we should be focusing on, where are our stakeholders seeking assurance, and how collectively and together can we provide that assurance? Because I think sometimes unhelpfully, we don't work as closely with our risk colleagues as perhaps we might do. And I think that one of the things that we've learned through the last 18 plus weeks is how important it is. So, as I said, working together, understanding the risks, the real risks facing mm. the organisation and looking at how we manage, mitigate and control those risks. OK, thank you. Uh, Robert, um, do you have anything to add to that? Or uh, otherwise, I, there's another question I'm quite interested in getting your views on. Yeah, look, really quickly, um, to build on Cosette's uh, SARS example, uh, when I was in the energy sector back in 2007, 2006, we were talking about bird flu. And um, bird, I mean, uh, some people in the organisation talked about bird flu, bird poo. Um, so there was a bit of dismissive kind of nature uh, to the way in which that was being considered. But I think what has happened in the intervening period is that resilience has been built in to the financial services sector. So although it wasn't specifically planned for this type of event, um, which is you know, a, a presumably very low probability, we thought, very high impact event, but it wasn't featuring highly on risk registers, 
But I think the resilience in the financial services sector has been there to cope with this in large extent. Now, we don't know yet what's going to happen, all the things that Cazette talked about in terms of credit quality, asset quality, how this is all going to unwind and what the cost ultimately is going to be for customers and financial institutions and other businesses. But I think we have managed to cope with the immediate impact, which we probably wouldn't have been able to without the incredible investments in, in technology um, and you know the, the facilitation of board meetings by this type of medium could not have been possible 10 years ago. But I think huge investments have gone in and we've, we've managed to cope with this, certainly in the immediate aftermath. Okay. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. OK, um, before you disappear, Robert, um, you seem to have disappeared already. Uh, I, I was going to ask you, uh, what, one of the things I've always felt quite strongly in the risk space is sometimes there's a tendency to focus on risk in the negative aspects, i.e. what can go wrong and how do we stop it going wrong? But uh, I guess my view has always been uh, with change, there is risk, but there are also opportunities. And I just wondered, as uh, a senior risk professional, senior risk executive, do you see that aspect coming into it more to say, actually, we're not just looking at what might go wrong, but actually what we need to, what opportunities are rising? Yeah, look, and I think this is an important positioning piece for risk functions, but also audit functions that Liz talked about earlier. Um, and Cazette's obviously mentioned heavily, um, you know, the impact of all of this on, on line one and, and business leading colleagues, you know, business leaders. The, the key thing here is that we're all trying to do the same thing. We're all trying to run successful, sustainable businesses into the long term. We want to work in partnership. And, and I think the key word is partnership and collaboration to get to the right outcome for our organisations and our customers. And I, what we have really seen is a way of coming together to work in, in some ways faster, more effectively, sweeping away lots of aspects of things that got in the way of, of actually helping our customers do what they need to do um, in a way that is transitioning and changing. Um, and that, that piece about partnership, I think, is incredibly important. We, we don't have our own furrows to plough. We have yep. a, a collegiate responsibility to manage our organisations to the most in the most effective way that we possibly can. And I hope coming out of this is an opportunity to really leverage that capability that we've developed. Okay. We also think as a, as a business that there is an opportunity to really accelerate our own strategy. Um, and, and that will be an enormous opportunity. But what we need to do is work appropriately and in, in a very, in a, almost in a disruptive way to ourselves to make sure that we don't lose all of the things that we've learned in the past few months and that we're able to adapt them into a BAU way of operating. Yeah. So that, that's what we're hoping for. So huge opportunity, okay. we think. That, that was actually going to be one of my questions, Robert, is really around some of these changes. There, I guess I'm, I'm not sure where organisations will end up, whether they will say that was COVID and we had to do it, but now we can get back to some of the old ways of doing things. And certainly some of my clients uh, are in relation to boards, for example, they're very keen to get back to face to face board meetings, which I understand, but they're almost saying we don't want to do another Zoom meeting or team meeting unless absolutely necessary. I, I just wondered, Robert, what your thoughts were in terms of how, how are you going about trying to make sure the new practices that are really good are being embedded and we don't just revert to type uh, without without thinking through it? Well, we're, in some ways, we're not going to have a lot of choice um, because and that means we need to get better and smarter at working this way mm -hmm. because we, you know, although the government is saying, you know, get, get back into the office, I, I think the reality of that is that we have a, you know, a real responsibility to make sure that we're not adding to a potential problem that could permeate for longer and impact the economy for longer. So we, we are definitely taking the view that work, working from home, as you know, RBS came out and said in the last few days, is the way forward for the foreseeable future, unless you have to go into work. OK, so we don't want to add to it. We want to become better and better at running our business this way. Um, yep. And where we get to a point where people and colleagues can go safely back into work for collaboration purposes, for you know, setting of strategy, those types of discussions where you probably do need to be in a room ideally, yep. we will want to facilitate that. But we see our offices changing completely in terms of their use. 
Um, it's not going to be, you know, 80% desks for all colleagues. It's going to be a very different working environment going forward. Sure. Okay. May I please it? May I please add to that? Um, I wanted to pick up on two things towards the end of those remarks. Um, the first is that I was actually astonished at how there is technology out there that enables collaboration in ways that, honestly, I'd never really imagined were possible. To give you one example, when you look at Six Sigma process reengineering, typically what happens is you get all of the right people who are involved in that process every single step of the way, whatever piece they own, into one physical place. You map it out on the wall, you put post-it notes there and the whole nine yards, and then you re-engineer the process. I could not believe it, but we did it virtually. There is software out there that allows you to do exactly the same thing with post-it notes and everything. Mm -hmm. And so I think with you know, to, to go back to what was said earlier about 10 years ago, technologically, none of this would have been possible, but it is now. I do believe that working from home will not preclude such collaboration because of the technology above and beyond virtual meetings like this. There are other ways to collaborate with each other, which is just a joy to see. The other thing I wanted to build on, and, um, and this may have other things to add about this particular point. This goes to the point of collaboration across the three lines. So I think obviously up until now, each of the three lines had very segmented accountabilities. And it was not always easy to work together because in part of the perception of the accountability and not wanting to poison the well or anything like that. However, when you find where the new borderline is in helping change products and services at a time of need like this, one has to think that there is a permanent way of working together that we can take away from that, that allows us to continue to learn from each other, yet still preserve those distinct purviews of those accountabilities. Liz, you may have some thoughts on this. I absolutely uh, agree with you, Cosette. Uh, and I think it's not just about the relationship with um, our risk stakeholder colleagues, but one of the things that we've taken forward is the relationship with audit committees. So as part of our conversations, we've identified some heads of internal audit as recently as um, a week ago, who haven't spoken to their audit committee since before lockdown um, because governance committees have been suspended. I know <gasps> gov governance committees have been suspended because of them not being prepared to take this virtual forum uh, environment, um, which is of concern to the Institute. So we've been talking about how we can move that forward and how we can strengthen that relationship moving forward. So I think that's a positive that's come out of this. The other positive, as I said earlier, is the relationship, the really strong relationship with our risk colleagues. Mm -hmm. And also, from my perspective, to get into the internal audit piece, um, you know, one of the things that I've been talking about for some months, if not years, is the speed of getting out the findings from an audit. And, you know, it always used to be we have finished the field work. Now you all wait six weeks or more before you see what the findings were. Well, we're now doing it in 48 hours, getting reports out to our audit committee, to our um, senior management team, to our risk colleagues to say these are the issues. Um, and now we're going to work with the business to improve things. So much um, Robert talked about it smarter, faster working, um, making sure that we can audit remotely. So why do we have to schlep all over the country? But actually, we can do auditing like this. There are some you know, downsides and it's about understanding those and thinking about how we manage those. But yeah. a huge amount of positivity, I think, coming out of this. Yeah. So I guess it's getting that right balance between yes. some of the face to face stuff that we are all probably missing quite a lot, but also some of the new ways of working and incorporating them. Um, one, one of the uh, if, uh, just to say to uh, everyone in the in the audience, if anybody does have any comments, please uh, let us know, wait, 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 uh, raise your hand and we'll be able to see it using the facility. Um, but one, one area I was very keen to just get 
the, the panel's views on as well were really around skills and uh, and development and training. So I, I guess you know does does all this mean we need a different type of chief risk officer? Do risk committees need better training? Uh, do we need different skills on our risk committee than we we thought we might need four or five months ago? Um, any thoughts, maybe Robert, starting with you? Thanks, Hanif. Um, I, I, th I think in this space, interestingly, our, our focus is turning towards colleagues who are training and coming into our organisation as opposed yeah. to the kind of more settled, um, you know, typically board members, but it could apply to board members who are joining the company afresh, you know. How are we going to onboard colleagues in this environment? How are, we, how are we going to take care of their career development? How are we going to take care of their support networks? How are we going to provide the facilities that they need to develop their careers? Mm. So I, I think it's quite a general point that we are very focused on. We're calling it a life more virgin. Um, and we're trying to develop what we believe to be the, the kind of um, principles and, and rules of the road around that. But it is a concern to us um, because it's all very well if you've been in an organisation for a while, you've got your network developed, you can do things this way because you know who to contact. But if you're not meeting in groups of people in the way that you would typically do, you're maybe not having a dinner after the board where you do some of the kind of more um, kind of nuanced uh, conversations about how things are going. The, the, there will be things that are missing um, and we need to work out how we close those gaps because if those gaps develop, um, that, that is going to potentially have a material impact to the effectiveness of the organisation over time. Great. Uh, I certainly um, take fully on board your comment about the onboarding aspect, Robert. I've joined a board recently and one of the activities is running some conferencing facilities uh, at the organisation and we've had three board meetings, but um, They've all been since pandemic and I've not actually seen what these facilities look like. I've mm. not met most of the people and it is not not easy, uh, particularly mm -hmm. for uh, organisations that perhaps their um, induction isn't quite where I would like it to have otherwise been. So, so just to go back to the other part of your question about skills, I think there may be two additional things to think about. One of them for the people who are already here in any institution, it's about mindset. So we're, we're this this thing we were just talking about earlier with regard to cross collaboration and moving that borderline, yet preserving the purview of accountability in a new way, is a new mindset. It's a new way of working, and this is the critical takeaway I think for the people who are already inside the walls of the company to take away and really think about how do you embed that. So that's one observation. The other point about skills is it then also comes back to the changing priorities of the firm. So, for example, if a firm had a book of work and had a certain bunch of people to hire, well, to some extent, there are some things in banks that have not changed. IBOR transition would be one that comes to mind, for example, where the deadline hasn't really moved. The work still has to be done and the people that you might have needed to hire from a skills perspective or a capacity perspective to get that work done still have to be hired and you mm -hmm. still have to do the work. Plus any new ways of working that might need a shift in skills as well. And so banks, I think, are grappling with, you know, they, they some of them had hiring freezes and other things where now they need to come out the other side and think about this medium term proposition of what is my real book of work and what yep. are the skills I need to execute? OK, thanks, Cosette. We've got a couple of questions. Um, uh, one is from Stephen. Um, Stephen, do you want to unmute and uh, pose your question? Yeah, it's just building on uh, what Robert was saying about, and your question actually, Hanif, as well, on kind of capabilities. And I was just wondering what the panelists thought around about the, the skills and capabilities of uh, the CRO in the future, because my experience, certainly in FS, I tend to be from uh, a credit background, which drives a certain uh, way of working. And I'm just wondering what um, the panel's view is of the, the capability and kind of mindset of the CRO of the future. Um, Robert, do you want to answer that? Well, I, um, I, and I should probably declare that uh, Stephen and I used to work together in the same team. 
So, uh, Stephen, thank you very much for your question. I hope uh, life's going well uh, for you in the lockdown in, in Presswick. Um, so, look, I, I, I think I, I think it's a continued development of what we've been seeing happen in, in senior leadership development. I think there needs to be ongoing rounded development of senior leaders. Um, we, we, we've got other topics that we're tackling at the moment. Um, you know, as businesses relating to Black Lives Matter and, you know, other equality issues that we're, we're continuing to look at. And I, and I do think, I mean, I don't have specific lists of things that I think need to be changed or, or different um, to what they are just today. But I do think leaders of the future will need to be more rounded than coming from a credit background. Um, I think they will need to have developed skills in financial services, potentially in other sectors as well. Um, and be able to adapt um, their approach um, through you know, ongoing learning to how they need to perform and how they need to be um, providing that direction and leadership at the top. Uh, I think they need to be probably more hands-on than they have been, um, or some have been, um, because I think it's, it's about really understanding at grassroots level what's happening with colleagues, what's happening with customers, um, and how we continue to build our knowledge base uh, through you know, internal data and also data that's available increasingly externally to benchmark how we're doing. So Stephen, thank you for your question. And I think what you've uh, just explained, Rob, Robert, is actually very consistent with the feedback we've had during our consultation phase and all the outreach we've done, that actually it's a much broader set of skills and increasingly it's a focus on some of the softer skills as well. Um, we've got a question from David. Uh, David, do you want to unmute and ask? Uh, and we'll probably finish off with that question. Uh, well the answer to that question rather than the question itself. David? Okay, thanks Hanif and, and thanks everyone on the panel. Um, I particularly was interested in Liz's comment uh, earlier about the new three lines model. Uh, I'll have to remember to, um, to forget to use the defense word when I'm talking about the three lines model. Um, the fascination for me isn't just the fact that we've got a revised model out there. It's more the fact that, you know, it talks about the first line. It talks about the second line. It talks about external assurance, but it's come from the third line. Uh, it's come from the Institute of Internal Auditors globally. So I know it's obviously taken wider consultation, but from what perspective does that does the new three lines model get approval, ownership, buy-in from the representation of the first and the second lines? Or do we think, and, and particularly I'm thinking about the risk coalition and the guidance there, to what extent her, uh, you know, would you need to reflect any changes that come have come out of the new three lines model? So I suppose it re relates to all of the, the, the panel, um, but just interested in your views, because I guess we're going to be see this this is going to be popping up in a, in a number of different webinars in, yep. in, in the coming weeks and months. OK, um, I'll, I'll just respond very briefly uh, and then maybe Liz can add to it, uh, David. And I guess this is uh, obviously a new piece of uh, guidance that's come out from the Institute. Um, and I think one of the things we will do is kind of uh, obviously go through it and reflect on it and work out kind of how that fits in with what we've actually done. Um, I, I think with, with the guidance itself, uh, we'd be hugely reluctant to make changes having just published it. And I think we need to leave it for a few years and then take stock. But certainly we can add to that through uh, various, you know, through, through our, our blogs and articles and things that we've done just to add some additional uh, a, a veneer over it to, to comment and reflect on it as well. Uh, Liz, I don't know if you want to add to that. I think you you have captured it, um, Hanif, and I think it's exactly the same thing that we're going to have to do as we revise and update our financial services code and also uh, our new um, internal audit code for private and third sectors. Um, I don't think it is a significant change. What I do think is that it tries to simplify the process, and I think that perhaps the way that it has done it is lacks a little clarity in terms of how all of the three lines sit together. So the Institute is going through it at the moment. We will pr be producing um, a blog or um, a piece of information that talks about how we need to uh, use it moving forward. It, it's still very new. It only came out on Monday. 
Okay, thank you, Liz. Um, I'm just conscious it's just two o'clock now, so uh, I think we ought to draw this part of the proceedings to a close. Um, I'll hand back to Heather in a moment, but before I do, I'd just like to really thank Cosette, Liz and Robert uh, for their really helpful and valuable insights. Uh, I found it a really interesting discussion myself uh, and uh, look forward to catching up with all of you later. Thank um, you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, Heather, shall I hand back to you? And uh, after that, we can uh, run the demo of Gabby for those who are able to stay with us. Yep. Thank you very much. Um, I'd just like to thank Hanif and our panel members, um, Liz, Cosette and Robert today for providing such an insightful discussion and of course to all our listeners. So the Risk Coalition has developed an online tool to help firms self-assess against their guidance in raising the bar, the Gap Analysis and Benchmark and Insights Tool or GABI. A former senior supervisor recently commented that the regulator expects all board risk committees to assess their effectiveness effectiveness annually and that Gabby provides an excellent gap analysis and benchmarking tool for this purpose. In the remaining 20 to 30 minutes of this webcast, Hanif will provide a brief demonstration of Gabby. Please do stay on for this if you can. And for members of the Chartered Bank Institute, today's webcast can be recorded as part of your ongoing CPD. Please remember to record this via the logbook in the members area of our website. Once again, I'd like to thank you for your participation and thanks for listening. I'll pass you back to Hanif. Great. Thank you, Heather. And uh, thanks, everyone, uh, for staying on. Uh, if you want to uh, switch your cameras on anything, feel free. Um, and happy to take questions as we go along. What I'll do is uh, go back to sharing my screen. Um, if I can find the right page for this. Uh, There we go. Right. Um, what I thought I'd do is just start off by just mentioning the guidance very briefly in case you're not familiar with it. So uh, this is basically uh, the, the document itself. Uh, you'll be able to download it. Uh, there's no charge for the download from the Risk Coalition's website. And if I just scroll down a little bit, uh, you'll see these are the members and supporters of it. And we have got it set up in two parts. So part A is this on um, risk committees. Uh, you can see the highlighted bit on the left is a principle on board accountability. Uh, and the key thing there, for example, is that the board retains uh, account ultimate accountability for the organization's uh, principal risks and their risk management arrangements. And you can see we kind of work through the eight principles. And if we go on to the next uh, page, you can see this is how we've set it up. So on the left hand side, we've got the principle on board accountability and on the right hand side, we've got uh, the paragraphs of guidance. And if you scroll on, you'll see we go on to principle A2, A3 and so on. So that's really uh, how the guidance has been set up. What I'll do now is just go into the uh, the tool that we have. We call it Gabby, Gap Analysis and Benchmarking Insights. How it works is uh, it's really about getting uh, a cross section of views or 360 degree views from various people in your organization. Um, what happens is somebody is appointed administrator, normally somebody from the risk function. Uh, they have to fill, it, fill out a very simple spreadsheet with email details of key people who will contribute to this uh, assessment. We would expect that to be uh, the risk committee members, senior members from the risk team, uh, the chief internal auditor, maybe other senior heads of uh, senior auditors in the team, and of course the first line uh, representatives as well. So um, some of the execs, plus also maybe heads of division. If we go straight into the document, uh, sorry, into the uh, the tool, you'll see, hopefully in uh, not too long, we go straight into the tool itself. And uh, the four tiles here, bottom right is some information about the Risk Coalition, just where you can download it. If I make that a little bit smaller, you might be able to see it a little bit better. So you can see there's a link to the guidance. On the left-hand side, there's a helpline. It's been well-established uh, and uh, very responsive. Top right, we've got a little user guide, a set of videos to show you how that actually works as a participant, how you fill it out. But frankly, it's very, very easy. And I'll just show that to you in the space of probably 60 seconds. If we go to the questionnaires and look at review responses, this is one that I've completed earlier. And you can see board accountability on the top right is one of the key principles. And under that, we've got six paragraphs of guidance, uh, as uh, I showed you a little bit earlier on. 
And all you're asked to do is against each of the key principles, uh, sorry, e e each of the key guidance paragraphs indicate how well you do uh, achieve this. So this is about uh, the risk committee being an advisory committee, but providing consolidated oversight over uh, principal and emerging risks. And you just rate it uh, as either we need to do this much better, we've used quite colloquial language here, or we could do it better, or we do it very well. So you just pick and choose amongst that. And then on the right hand side, we've got the, uh, a lead in to say these are areas we could do better at. And you just select the ones that you think are important. If you think we can do more on emerging risks and you think that's an important area, you select that. Uh, if you think actually the role of the risk committee in having that overview or purview isn't clear enough, you can tick that. So it's very simple to complete. If you have comments, you just add them in here. There's one I put in earlier that the board's own role isn't clear enough. Um, and you just work your way through. When you get to the end, if you go save and next, you get to the next section. Uh, this is one on composition and membership, the second principle. And similarly, you just work your way through. And when you get to the end, that's it, all done. Uh, you can download your responses for future reference by clicking on the red icon on the right. Um, if you're the administrator, you can just go into status and see exactly who's responded and who's not. So here are some, uh, some of the individuals who've completed it. The reds are the ones who haven't started and the yellows are the ones who are partway through. So very simple to keep track of it as well. But I think the really interesting bit is really around the reporting, which I've just gone into. If we click on view reports, you'll see what comes up first of all is a dashboard. Uh, we call it a grid and you can see going across the top are the key principles, uh, board accountability, first one, composition, membership, next. We've got about a dozen people having completed it. So there's a bit of dummy data in here. And what we've then able to see is under the principle, each of the guidance paragraphs, how well we're doing. So if we wanted to look at, for example, composition and membership and said, actually, professional education is looking uh, a little bit on the dodgy side. It looks orange. Uh, you can see at the bottom it's com coming down towards the red end of things. Let's look at that in a little bit more detail. We can click on that. And what you get right away is uh, uh, a, a, a donut shaped chart which shows you exactly where we stand. In fact, we've got nine respondents to this, uh, five saying we could do it better, two saying that we need to do it much better, and actually two quite happy. On the right hand side, you can see um, the radio buttons that were selected. So six, of, six out of nine actually say that continuing professional education is actually needed for the risk committee members. Uh, four are concerned about groupthink, and four are concerned that an expert on the committee is dominating the discussions. So there's a few things that's very easy to go away and start thinking about and addressing. Down at the bottom, we've got some comments. So somebody's put in a specific comment that uh, this CPD program is managed by the company secretary and the board rather than board risk committee. So maybe that's a bit of a non-comment uh, saying actually it's somebody else's responsibility. So again, maybe it's a chance to be thinking more focused in a more focused way about that. Um, What's uh, I think really interesting is if we go to add filter, we can look at things, for example, by role and you're asked to indicate your role when you go in in the first time as a respondent. And by going into there, we can pick which uh, areas we want to look at. So we can look at things, uh, maybe look at what the first, second and third line think. And let's forget about the non execs and others. Uh, and we've got five people responding from the first, second and third line. Four are saying, actually, this isn't good enough and one person saying, actually, this is seriously not good, good enough. Um, but actually, again, this is interesting because if we look at the non-exec perspective, two out of three of the non-execs think they're getting actually pretty good development and they don't need any more. So really uh, a, a good trigger for discussion. So um, one of the big advantages with this uh, tool is it actually gives you the ability to look at things from different perspectives. If we look at heat maps, that brings it all together. So in this heat map, we're able to see how things done on the left, we can see first, second, third line and others. And across the bottom, you can see uh, the, the, each of the key principles. If we want, if we look at risk information, for example, we can see actually the ones who aren't terribly happy are the non-execs, uh, whereas the first, second and third line think probably they're not getting bad information. So again, a really good opportunity to have some dialogue around that. We can swap around. This is actually showing all the questions together. What we can do is maybe look at a specific area. So one of the principles is uh, principal risks and viability. We can have a look at that one and see how things change. 
and it all changes in front of you, uh, which makes it really easy to do the analysis. And we can see first line is particular concerns about horizon scanning. We discussed some of that in the uh, discussion session earlier on. Uh, they're not at all happy with it, but maybe some of the other parts of the organization are, are much, much happier with that. Looking at operation, uh, operational resilience, uh, third line non-execs actually seem quite happy, maybe a bit more concerned by first and second line. So again, it's very easy to see where some of the key issues are and to focus on it. Um, just show you a few more areas just to finish off. Uh, in analysis, the first thing you get if we're going to compare, again, it's a different way of looking at it, but it's comparing, you can see up here, it's showing the left bar is showing the first line and it's showing everything else in the right. So the principle is board accountability. And down the bottom, we've got the guidance paragraph. So you can see how things stack up. Um, if you want, you can just play around with this so you can see how it first line compares with non-execs. And again, right away, you, you see what the position is. Um, you can see the comments further down and the issues. So if we look at the issues, we can see uh, this one's quite interesting. Timely interaction with other board committees. Um, the first line, none of the, none of the two respondents thought that was an issue. But uh, by the second line and third line, um, sorry, sec the second line and the non-execs, three out of four thought that was an issue. So again, you can see the differences between the three lines, uh, no longer lines of defense uh, from what Liz was saying, but you can see how that, that all works. Progress is showing this year versus last year. So when you run it again 12 months later or six months later, you can start tracking progress. We've not got dummy data for two years. So at the moment, we've just got uh, the two bars the same, but you can imagine how that might look and be able to demonstrate progress to you uh, about how things are moving. And then if you go to all charts, that's just summarizing everything, uh, all the responses together, and uh, you can see how, how everything stacks up there. Um, you can filter it as well uh, by, by the different categories. If you want to just look at the comments, you can do that as well. So if we look at the comments for board accountability, you can see these are the comments that people have made in the free text boxes. So it's all pretty straightforward uh, and simple to use. Um, happy to take any questions um, if anybody's got anything. Uh, please just come off mute and I'll be able to kind of answer any questions or if you've got any observations, be happy to answer those. If not, uh, I'll just show you one last bit, which is um, if you want to find out more about Gabby, uh, if you go to the Risk Coalition's webpage, that's riskcoalition.org.uk, uh, there's a tab at the top, make it a bit larger so you can see it. You can see it says Meet Gabby. And if we click on that, you get to our, what we call our Gabby page. And this is just uh, some background, just summarizing some of the key points we talked about. So it explains the two parts to it, part A and part B one covering risk committees, one covering risk functions, uh, identify some of the key benefits. Um, one of the key things uh, you'll see up here is number four, is how you compare against your peers. In a group situation, uh, so for example, if you've got a financial service organization, which is involved in uh, banking, in uh, insurance and asset management, uh, within your own organization, you can compare how the different parts of that organization work. And later in the year, we're gonna be able to make available some benchmarking against other organizations once we have enough data from uh, subscribers to be able to be able to uh, do this in an anonymous way. Uh, and if you sc scroll down, you can see it talks about how it works in a very simple way. There's a, there's a guide uh, using the screenshots, but also maybe helpful for you is further down, uh, if you or your colleagues are interested in seeing the demo again, you can either just let us know or there's a demo here on the on the screen and equally that we have some open demos if anybody's interested to join again i've given you a quick run through so you probably won't need to do that but if any of your colleagues are interested in it again we can obviously do that and uh, further down uh, there's a sub subscribe button which takes you straight through to it that's pretty much uh the the demo um if there's any questions happy to answer them let me just go off screen sharing um if there's anything else uh, to do with today's discussion that uh, anybody was interested in following up, uh, you'll have seen the LinkedIn details. You can reach me on LinkedIn. Um, otherwise, um, I'd like to thank you all for your participation. 
uh, appreciate all your all of you spending your time joining us today and uh, hopefully hear from you in due course uh, uh, if you've got any comments or, or feedback. OK, thank you all very much, um, Heather. Um, I think we're pretty much done here today. So thank you again for helping organize this. Um, no so uh, yeah, so thank you again to Chartered Bank Institute for, for hosting this event. Um, and again, as I say, happy to answer questions and take comments offline if anybody has anything they want to ask. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, the recording for this webcast will be posted on our website um, tomorrow. Um, so thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, Hanif. OK, thank you, Heather. Appreciate your help with this.